welcome everybody here today and those live streaming with us. I'm sorry that music went on and on, a little bit repetitive. There seems to be a pattern there. There's a link with Phil Gregg. <laughs> she did love children. She did love singing. She did love, she, not that she sang, she did love The King and I, musicals, etc. And that is a song that I recall very strongly as she danced around the kitchen and sang in her way many, many years ago. So I pay my respects to all those who've been here before us and those who've travelled this afternoon in rather inclement weather here, cold and wet afternoon in Tyree. Thank you. We're here today to celebrate the long life of my mother, Phil Gregg, who died last week aged 98 years and seven months. She was very ready to let go of her life. So we feel very grateful that she could quietly and rapidly let go after a very short illness. I was especially grateful that my sister Susie could warn me that mum's more recent pattern of good days and bad days had not returned to any good days over the past week. With my husband David, we could drive to Taree at short notice to spend a final day with Mum, while the staff at Storm gave all relevant and very wonderful support. Mum enjoyed a mostly very happy life, as well as a long one. She was born Phyllis May Poppleton, but she was always Phil, not Phyllis. She lived in Dungog. She was born in 1922. Ultimately, she returned to country New South Wales at the age of 94 with her husband, Ross, to live in Storm Village, Taree. Dad lived at Taree for only just a month. Mum has been there four and a half years. Mum talked a lot about Dungog in recent years, mostly recalling her early childhood. She had no personal connection with a farming life. She never rode a horse, milked a cow, learnt to shoot rabbits, or any such rural pursuits. But she did talk a lot about school days in Dungog. She particularly amused me when justifying achieving her grand age as being the result of having to walk to and from primary school in Dungog every day. This turns out to be a distance of just over one kilometre. Perhaps children today don't walk long distances to school either, but in past years, and particularly the years of her parents' generation in Dungog, long walks to school were very normal. I often noticed when out with Mum in Taree that she looked at people in case she recognised someone from her years in Dungog. This, of course, was rather unlikely to happen after moving from there when she was 16 and moving to Taree when she was 94. However, she's always been delighted when finding anybody with a connection to or an interest in her beloved Dungog. Perhaps um, Susie drove her back to Dungog actually a couple of years ago. She insists that it had barely changed since she'd lived there as she only saw one car moving on the streets when she viewed from the, the town from the top of the hill. Mum's early years were lived in the shadow of the Depression and then World War II, but she simply never referred to deprivation through those years. This suggests to me that she was always well provided for and her choices in life were accomplished regardless of the times in socio-political senses. School in Dungog was followed by high school in Maitland as a boarder for at least one year and then business college in Sydney and a stenographer role with Lever Brothers. Like many other young women, she enrolled in 1941 for armed service with the Women's Auxiliary Australian Air Force. She was 18. She trained in signals and was promoted to captain until demobilising in 1945 at the end of the war. By this time, she'd met fellow Air Force serviceman Ross Gregg. Together they planned married life, beginning within days of Ross returning from the Air Force service in Moritai at the end of the war in October 1945. Mum had a very happy family life with husband Ross and three children in Taramara and then North Taramara for some 70 years. There was a year out in, um, of Taramara in 1962 
Mum, Dad, Susie and I lived in Hong Kong while Dad progressed his training to be a manager for the shipping company based there, which traded between the east coast of Australia, Philippines, Hong Kong, Taiwan, Korea and Japan. Travel became a major feature of Mum's middle years while Ross was employed in the shipping world. And then again, following his retirement, when they travelled widely in Australia with the local Probus Club. Dad commonly organised Probus trips and Mum regarded them always as being great fun. However, two trips in her early life caused great distress to Mum as she had to leave her children behind. In 1956, Mum had to endure a lengthy, clearly compulsory if you're a good wife type of trip to the Far East, as Japan and Hong Kong were known. B Brother Bill was nine, I was six, and Susie had her first birthday while they were away. The pain of this can only be guessed for Mum, for whom family life was almost all. Then in 1962, when we lived a year in Hong Kong, Bill stayed at boarding school in Sydney. This was very tough for Phil, but there might have been some compensations. She had significant time totally free of domesticity. She had two staff, or armors, to manage domestic life. Mum, during that time, helped in some way in a local orphanage, which fits, which fits with her love of little children. Um, and she was also able to spend time at the nearby Ladies' Recreation Club. I had great fun swimming there at the weekends when free of school, so I have no idea how the ladies filled their time. However, Mum did manage to return to life back in Taramara as a happy wife and mother, involved with Presbyterian church committees as a school parent, a gardener, a social tennis player, and particularly developing as a hostess, supporting her husband's career. This was quite significant as it almost in, always involved entertaining Japanese men and occasionally their wives through the shipping links. At the time, post-war prejudice against Japanese people was quite widespread, but Mum had really enjoyed travelling in beautiful Japan and supported Dad's business interests and his Japanese connections very warmly. Mum had clear plans for her three children. Brother Bill, being a boy, was expected to be given a university education, which neither Mum nor Dad had. The girls, Susie and I, were instead to be turned into ladies by the education offered at Presbyterian Ladies College, Pimble. Firstly, Bill refused a university education and cho chose a trade course in electronics instead. Susie, having an older and bossy sister, felt the PLC was absolutely not what she wanted either, so she chose the new local, local high school instead. I did fall into line, but it's clearly failed. It's highly unlikely that Mum would have expected her hoped-to-be ladylike daughter Virginia to attend her funeral service today, um, the celebration of her life, wearing jeans. I'd have to say I wouldn't have expected to wear jeans for this service this afternoon either, but I did pack for a short camping holiday with visits to Mum over here from Adelaide and Susie's concerned text to me arrived far too late for me to review my packing. My brother Bill's sudden and totally unexpected death at the age of almost 21 was a totally shattering experience to our family and of course very much to Mum. She couldn't talk about Bill or his death for many, many years. But over time, she was able to find more pleasure again with particular companionship from her local church community. Subsequently for me, Bill's close friend, school friend, David, became my wonderful husband, now of 50 years. He clearly recalls feeling very warmly wel welcomed at our house when he was a schoolboy, a friend of Bill, my brother Bill's, and of course, this relates to Mum's delight in visitors. I have school friends of 60 years or so now who, like David and others, do also recall Mum making everybody seem welcome and usually being able to offer the delights of her recent baking. When Susie and I moved on with our lives, then out of the family home, the local bowling club and bridge groups also became major interests for Mum. 
I had moved to South Australia immediately following my undergraduate training at the age of 21, leaving another gap in our home life. Fortunately for all, Susie remained close by and later married and produced three young children as well as continuing her career. I also worked while being a parent of young children and this constantly bothered mum. Of course, she married at a time when women's careers were totally curtailed by marriage and family. The role of husbands as fathers was very limited also and they simply worked long, breadwinning hours with little time or skills for caring for children or domesticity. Mum would regularly and worriedly ask how my husband could manage while I worked and it seemed particularly shocking that I occasionally left him and our two children for trips from Adelaide to Sydney to visit family or attend courses or conferences. Despite all of this, or maybe because of all of this, um, Mum was very needed to help with Susie and her family and she filled the role of being grandparent very enthusiastically. One memorable event in recent years occurred when Susie and I brought our four granddaughters to the Upper Lansdowne Farm, specifically for time with Phil. Phil suggested that she'd need to have them wearing name tags so she'd know who was who. Naturally, four girls aged between six and nine were delighted to make large, clearly red labels. Amusingly though, they then decided to swap the name tags just as Phil arrived at the farm for the day. Luckily, she laughed the whole day, never knew who was who, and it didn't matter. She was delighted by the playfulness of four happy girls. Of course, ongoing contact with her great-grandchildren in recent years has been specially treasured, and we've tried to ensure that she had plenty of it. Life in Storm Village, Taree, was not planned. But once Susie had moved to the Upper Lansdowne area, the need to care for Mum and Dad nearby became very important. South Australia was barely worth considering, as Mum clearly felt the need to be near to friends and more family than she had in South Australia. She'd always taken particular pleasure in having access to sunshine from her home. Inquiries at Storm suggested that they could accommodate Mum in a room with tall glass doors facing north. Sitting either outside or just inside these doors has been the greatest pleasure for Mum over her four years in Storm. There's hardly been a phone call I've had with Mum without her thanking me for choosing Storm. In fact, it was Susie who chose Storm, but never mind. She also reminded me in every phone call that she was being well cared for, enjoyed the meals and had really lovely company whenever she needed it. She enjoyed walking outside, up the driveway regularly, potentially poisoning the local lizards with her offerings of sweet biscuits. She did continue her daily walks, with decreasing ability to get as far as the lizards, till very recently. It was worth the lizards having a little bit of safety, I think. Mum's death last week caught us by surprise, because it was so fast. She had said that she'd had enough before, but then she said she enjoyed her 98th birthday last year so much that she'd have a go at 99 and then maybe 100. It wasn't to be. Deaths don't usually happen by arrangement with the wider families. However, most of us change arrangements to fit in, of course. But COVID-19 has interfered with our interstate families who really wanted to join us to celebrate their love of Granny and Great Granny Phil. Our daughter Katrina lives in Melbourne with her wonderful children Olive, 11, and Sunday, 8. Our son Andrew lives in Adelaide with his wife Aidy and lovely daughter Madeline, known more fondly as Maddie. They're very disappointed to think that being with us even this Friday in Sydney might mean that they can't get home again, or if they do, they could be quarantined. That would be totally intolerable intoler for our Melbourne family again. So whilst they're unlikely to share in either this celebration today or the Taramara one on Friday by being with us, they are with us today in spirit and using the more modern communication facility of live streaming. So thank you, Mum. Thank you on behalf of all your very caring family for showing us unconditional love through your long and very loving life. Thank you.
I'd like to introduce my sister Susie. Thank you, Ginny. I'm just going to try and share a few memories of mum that link in with the background that Ginny's given us. Um, and it was really only in the last couple of days when Ginny and I were discussing what we wanted to say today that Ginny pointed out that I've really not lived far from mum for her entire life, so I have had a very close relationship. I'd never moved very far away. As Ginny said, mum always welcomed our friends into her home and she loved cooking and she was a good cook. So one of my stories relates to that. When she was entertaining some of these visitors from overseas and the, that, again, Ginny has mentioned, one amusing story relates to an occasion when mum was entertaining some Japanese visitors <coughs> in the early 1950s. Mum had decided to include rice on her menu. And I think that was a bit of a brave task with Japanese guests. And I think I'm right at that time, maybe even not so many Australian families cooked rice regularly. Well, the only sink at the time was in the laundry adjoining the kitchen. Anyway, the guests all complimented Mum on her rice. And it was only as she was washing up after the visitors had left that she found that a cake of sunlight soap that had been on the laundry bench had stuck to the underneath of the colander where she drained the rice and then left it to keep sort of steaming. So the bubbles from sunlight soap had come all through the rice and um, added quite a unique flavour. <laughs> she also very happily prepared extra meals when our friends came to visit and loved it when we were all together. As Ginny said, once we all started school, Mum did enjoy playing cards, first solo, so bridge hasn't always been the main card game. Um, but later, Mum joined the Taramurra Bowling Club and had a long and happy association there. And we both mentioned how important family was to Mum. So when Ginny moved to Adelaide, Mum was very keen for the postman to arrive on his motorbike in the hope that there was a letter from Ginny. You, we didn't have mobile phones, you didn't ring so often. Letters were very important. One day, Mum was backing out of the driveway as the postie came along the footpath. Mum couldn't see him in her mirrors and the car and bike made contact. The postman fell off, luckily not hurt, and the bag of mail was spread across the path. The story was retold often that the mail was so important that she had to knock the postman over to get it. Okay, Mum loved becoming a grandmother and I, as I was the only daughter in Sydney, I certainly did benefit from her helping out with babysitting. But when I asked initially for some requests with child mining, she had to set a few firm guidelines because she'd not long started playing bowls and she had to work out what time she was prepared to give me. And this turned out to be a half a day a week and that day had to fit in with her regular bowling day. After 10 years of those regular commitments on a Wednesday afternoon and now three children, she then did ask me if she could have long service leave, please, because she and Dad wanted to have an extended holiday overseas when Dad had retired. As the grandchildren grew up, Mum enjoyed sharing stories of her early life with them. She would tell them how as a young child in Dungog, she must have been sleepwalking and then climbed into a parent's bed one night. They commented that her feet were cold and she said, oh, I've been to collect the milk from the house across the road. They thought she was making this up, but when they got up in the morning, her tale was confirmed when they found a pail of milk on the kitchen table and a subsequent conversation with the neighbour confirmed that Mum had gone over during the night and asked to collect the milk. <laughs> Another story was staying out too late at night in Melbourne during her time in the WAF. She and her special friend Sib had to climb in through the window to get back into the barracks and avoid any punishment. Yet another tale was Mum and Dad coming home late on a train from a ball in the, a ball in the city. Mum was heavily pregnant with Bill, 
and they fell asleep and missed Taramara Station and didn't get off the train to Warunga, a few stops further up. To get home, they walked up to the Pacific Highway and started heading south until the milkman doing his rounds picked them up and offered them a lift home, something my children and grandchildren found very amusing. In 2003, Mum and Dad moved into the landings, at the time a newly built Air Force retirement village in North Taramurra. They were some of the very first residents to move in. Mum was always such a warm and friendly person, and as she told us about their new friends at the landings, I could see that Mum had made it her business to welcome other new people, and she seemed to be helping everyone else settle in. Mum was very a very devoted wife to Dad. Later, as Dad became unwell, Mum cared for him at home, and then once he needed nursing home care in Sydney, Mum, now in her early 90s, would drive every second day and park behind the church and then walk across the Pacific Highway to visit Dad and spend time with him. As Ginny said, when Mum was 94, we thought it was time to bring them both to Taree. Mum had had no previous association with Taree other than visiting Harrington as a nine-year-old girl for a brief holiday. Right from her very first day at Storm Village, she felt very welcomed. Such a big move to go from living independently in her own villa in North Taramara to now come to hostel living and to give up her driving licence at the same time. That's when Mum mentioned to her new GP on the first day she met him at Storm that she liked playing bridge. Suddenly, it was only a day or two later, that Mum was picked up by a member of the Taree Bridge Club and taken to bridge. And I would like to thank Dawn, who's here today, for continuing to do this, sometimes three times a week for nearly three years. I think the staff and residents, along with the Bridge Club members, realised this was a very important time in Mum's week. I really believe her association with the Taree Bridge Club made a huge difference to her early times up here. During her time at Storm, I observed she be Mum became a little bit more cheeky and had a lovely sense of fun with the staff. She frequently, frequently had little jokes with them. Mum continued to care about her appearance and I became more aware that she'd worn necklaces very frequently in the last 20 years or so. Mum would check she was wearing a suitable coloured necklace or beads before joining the other residents for lunch or dinner. This is why I decided to wear a little collection of Mum's necklaces today. As Ginny said, Mum would go up to the lake and always return and report any lizard sightings. And as Mum became quaintly forgetful, storm staff coped with repeated inquiries about what the forecast temperature was or dealt with reports of her telephone not working on Fridays, as well as sometimes the television, all dealt with very tactfully. Visiting our farm was a great delight for Mum. She loved sitting on the veranda, admiring the view, commenting on how green the grass was. She regularly asked that I bring special residents out with her to show them the farm. Unfortunately, for a few reasons, but particularly with the COVID restrictions, this was not possible. Lunch at the farm had to include some of my home-baked bread. And even when it was recommended that mum's meals be softened or of a mash tex texture to assist her swallowing, mum always asked for the crust and ate several slices of bread. I want to thank all the staff for their, at Storm for their amazing care and love of mum. She has been cared for with great love, respect and fondness and I can't thank them enough for their care over the last four years particularly through the difficult times of COVID and then more significantly in the last six days or so. Thank you so very much. As we've sorted through Mum's belongings in the last few days, I found a little piece of paper that she'd kept in a drawer with this quote on it. It read, Life brings many gifts to us, and these are great and small, but the lasting gift of friendship is the dearest gift of all. I believe that the love and friendship that Mum shared with so many family and friends is how she would want us to remember her. 
I love you, Mum, and I will miss you so very much. Thank you, Susie. We'll now enjoy some music and some photos that we selected of Mum through the years with her family. I think you can imagine what fun we had choosing those photos and what a wonderful time just going through the family stories. She was a happy, fun person. I wonder if there's anybody here who would like to share any memories of Phil, make any comments, because we'd be very happy to hear any of those thoughts. You don't need to have prepared anything, Dawn. It would just be lovely for you to remind us. Would please, I'll come here so that others could hear. This is Dawn from the Bridge Club, Tari. Yeah. The Bridge Club really loved Phil, didn't we, girls? 
Now, um, I'd pick Phil up sometimes three times a week and, and she was always there waiting there at the front of the bridge club, out at the front of the storm, I should say. And she used to tell me about feeding the lizards. Been up today and fed the lizards. They're actually water dragons, you know. I, That's right. <laughs> I told her that, but they were always lizards. And uh, uh, as, as the time went on, her memory was getting a little bit less and less. And on the way into bridge, she would say, uh, Dawn, who am I playing with today? And I'd say, oh, you're playing with so-and-so. Oh, good. Three times she'd asked me that on the way in. But the minute she sat there and had those cards, she remembered the, her cards. She really played them well right up until the end. Yeah, we're very privileged to have Phil with us. And, every, and another thing I must tell you, um, she loved men, you know. Did you know that? <laughs> we had one man there called Walter, a lovely man, and, and she, when I'd say, you're playing with Walter today, Phil, oh, isn't that good, Dawn? You know, she was so happy. So, but we had lovely memories of your mum. We're going to really miss her. We have missed her in the last, yeah. the last 12 months. We've been playing now for the last... Six, eight months, I suppose, haven't we? But she said, I rang her and she said her back wasn't, she wasn't well enough to sit and play bridge. Hmm. But we had lovely times. Thanks very much for inviting us. Thank you, Dawn. In fact, I'm just remembering it was very disappointing to Mum that Susie and I didn't play bridge. Yes. In fact, sometimes... <laughs> Some, yes, she told you many times. Sometimes I'd ask her to explain something to me and she'd say, well, if you only played bridge, I would be able to tell you what I'm thinking or feeling. So I occasionally said, well, tell me in bridge terms. And she might say something like, well, it's a three of diamonds. And I'd say, well, um, thank you. And I'd go and find out that a three of diamonds was a very weak call or some such thing. I can't be specific, but she did sometimes tell me those things. And um, Susie and I haven't yet been inclined to play bridge. I said we were a disappointment. We're not necessarily ladies. We rejected a number of the values that we were expected to have. But we did ask her how she would like her funeral service to be quite some time ago. And she said, it has absolutely nothing to do with me. It's about you. So here we are today in a fairly informal manner. Is there anybody else who would like to share anything else? Her? Oh, Kathy, that's lovely. <laughs> Kathy from Storm, a fairly central position in Storm. Thanks. Well, <laughs> Phil was actually the first resident that I met at Storm. She was sitting in the foyer waiting to be picked up for bridge when I went there for my interview. So she, I sat down with her and she had a nice little chat with me and it was a lovely introduction for me to Storm. It really was. It was wonderful. Um, I think you've covered most of what I would have said. Her walks up, and it's not just water dragons, it was also blue tongue lizards. So, yes, so she was feeding all of them the bits of the niece biscuits and the scotch fingers that were set aside for the residents to eat. But <laughs> the... Um, yeah, the lizard's got a, a good supply of those, so that was a really lovely. And yes, she did become rather cheeky. She had particular residents that she liked revving up. <laughs> She'd stir them <laughs> um, in quite an innocent-looking way and as though she had dementia a lot worse than what she did, actually did. <laughs> It was wonderful for us to watch. <laughs> and we've got a couple of people that would have loved to have been here this afternoon, Robin and Sandy, who play up sometimes around the residence and Phil always really enjoyed their antics. So they were sorry that they couldn't be here this afternoon. But yes, it was a shame when COVID hit because she stopped playing bridge. That that was a shame that we that, that had to end for her. But other than that, she kept going on those walks and her absolute joy when she'd have visitors. And I was driving here in the car thinking, especially the little ones, but it wasn't just the little ones. The joy was there for all of her visitors, whoever came. Um, and yes, the farm. She would, she would tell us all about the farm 
um, when she was going, when she'd just been, how wonderful it was, how good the lunches were, <laughs> how good the bread was. <laughs> we, we always got all of those lovely stories. So we just knew just how much she was loved by her family and how much she loved her family too. So she will be very fondly remembered. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Anybody else? That I think Kathy and Dawn have known her the best of everybody here, and um, I delight in hearing those stories too. Um, so this virtually concludes our preparation for this afternoon. There's another piece of music to come, and following that, Everybody here is welcome to come to the farm this afternoon. It is out at Upper Lansdowne, but we would delight in having anybody's company to share a drink in celebration of the life of our mum, Phil Gregg. Thank you all for coming and watching today. I see trees that are green Red roses too I watch them bloom For me and you And I think to myself What a And I think to myself, oh, what a wonderful world. The colors of the rainbow, so pretty. Of the people passing by I see friends shaking hands Saying how do you do But they're really saying I love you But they're really sad.